Welcome to Renegade Inc, the show that allows us to think differently. Since the 2008 financial crisis, we have been consistently told that the economic recovery is going to plan. The problem with this line is that very few people believe it and even fewer have seen it. So what is the gap in capitalist thinking that stops the real economy recovering? Why is the 1% now concerned about capitalism's ability to deliver all it has promised? And is the current economic malaise across developed economies permanent or just a passing trend? We wanted a better insight into these questions, so we caught up with the Marxist professor of economics, Richard D. Wolff, to find out what's next for an economic system that now looks intellectually bankrupt. What sort of shapes the American dream in? You know, there's a way to torture a dog. You put your little biscuit, the dog jumps. You tell the dog, jump again, you put the biscuit. And then you, the biscuit is always out of reach. And at a certain point, if you actually do this experiment, the dog stops jumping. The dog isn't stupid after a while, realizes this is what it is. Because the dog's wasting all the energy and knows yeah. it'll never get the biscuit. Yeah, and it begins to notice the repetition of the torture, and the torture isn't pleasant. He's straining more and more and getting nothing. For the American, the mass of the American people, they are either at or just about to get to where the dog is when it stops jumping. In other words, this now begins to dawn on them that this isn't temporary, this isn't one of those dips out of which we will come. They kept hoping for that. It has been that way in the past, often enough that it's rational, but they're now turning to other things. That's why the interest in socialism, that's why they support Trump. He gives his finger to the system. That's exactly how they feel. He does all the naughty things a politician isn't supposed to. They want to do naughty things too, but they can't, so they have him acted out for them. But the more he fails to change the basic situation, and he is royally failing at changing it, which is, by the way, not in his fault. He didn't care to change it, but this is not a system that's very amenable to whatever the president does. Obama had to learn that too from the other side. But this will kill him. It killed Obama's support. It's going to kill his. Who's uh, metaphorically holding the biscuit for the dog? Who keeps putting The one percent, they hold the biscuit. The worst is, the metaphor I would use is, the whole society is on a speeding train. The train is roaring down the track. It's already visible that there's a stone wall that the track goes right into. And that if you don't do something, this fast train that we're all on is gonna hit that wall. And everybody knows it, but they're having such a good time. The cocktails taste so good that nobody does anything. Even though in the cocktail conversation, they talk to each other about the train and the wall. That they're on it. Yes. So if we further I don't that... know if you caught, you know who Ray Dalio is? Yes. I could pick others there. Warren Buffett has done this kind of thing. Others have done. There are an increasing number of, of major big capitalists who understand that they're on that train and where the train is going and what's going to happen. And are they worried? Because in some respects, when you say the 1%, are they in a sense driving that train? <laughs> because No, no. Or, or is the train structurally determined to hit that wall because of the economic policies? Right. That it's, it's structural. And they are in this peculiar place of not understanding that, not wanting to. They will assure you that they love capitalism, and capitalism is wonderful. Dalio makes that clear. Yeah, but he also says in the next breath, we need to recalibrate this. Absolutely, because he thinks this is a kind of odd capitalism. This is a capitalism that has gone off the rails, if I may mix the metaphor, and has to be brought back, because if you don't, you're going to kill the goose that lays the golden eggs, to play more metaphors. You, you are going to destroy the game. This game is a good game, capitalism. You're f***ing it up. And I've got lots of tokens, and I don't want you to screw my yeah, game Yeah, you're up. screwing me, but you're screwing yourself. Don't do it for me. Do it. Look, give up half of your wealth so that you can hold on to the other, because what you're doing threatens that we won't have anything. This is the same argument Roosevelt made in the 1930s, when the communist, socialists, and unions, who were very well organized, completely different from what it is today, they had just come off the 1930s, greatest unionizing drive in American history. Much greater than anything that happened before, much greater than anything that happened since. Millions of people who had never been in a union, whose parents had never been in a union, joined unions. And the unions were led by socialists and communists almost exclusively. 
was a very powerful thing. And they went to Roosevelt and they said, look, we elected you. You're a new president. You got to do something in this depression that we have here in the 30s. And the nice part was we would love to help you do that. The nasty part was if you don't, you're not going to be president very much longer. And they had that in their power to, to make that come true. So he went back, told his rich 1% friends that he's part of that. He, family with president before and he came back and he cut them a deal he said okay uh i will do for you more than you've asked but all that talk from you socialists and communist type about revolution that's got stuff you've basically uh, he didn't use these words you've got to become nice docile social democrats then we have a deal they accepted that there were a few who didn't and they groaned and moaned and mumbled but they accepted partly because many of them thought he couldn't deliver he did he went back to the rich people, and what he told them is what I just said to you. I have no money. The government's bankrupt. Too many people unemployed. There's no money. And I've got to do big things for the mass of people. The only way to pay for that is you, you have the money. You've got to give it to me. I'm going to tax you half of it, and you're going to loan me the other half. And they went crazy. What are you talking about? I'm going to create Social Security. We never had that before. Unemployment compensation. We never had that before either. And then you know, 15 million jobs were created with government money, paying people a salary so they could stay in their homes. And it was all tax and borrow from the rich. But he never had this before, a massive redistribution of wealth from the top to the middle and the bottom. The last 50 years have fixed that by doing exactly the reverse. And that's trickle up economics, yes. is it not? Yes. The people who scream against redistribution have been doing it for 40 years. But just the other direction. Right. So when your Ray Dalios or your billionaire class come out uh, and say, actually, game's stop. up here, stop, we've got to... We've got to go back a little bit to hold on. They're worried. Yes, Right. very. So what is it in that class of people? What is the lacuna, the gap in their thinking that says, yeah, it's, it's veered out uh, of kilter, but they can't really get to the root cause of why? Because I haven't heard one... Uh, Where would they get it from? Well, that's the point. I went to the same schools they did. There's wow. nothing there. There Fine. was no criticism that was structural. There was no exposure to Marxist thinking, and, or for that matter, other kinds of thinking that are critical and structural. So they just don't know. But it's even worse for them because there's no humility, because they can't put their hands up and say, listen, we just haven't had any exposure to this. And because we've become billionaires amongst the American dream, which have put us in the... 0.1%, it's reconfirmed that everything we've done is correct because it's given us tokens, we've worked the system, and look, this is what success looks like. Yeah, they, some of them do that. There are some that are smarter than that. Are they? Not. Yeah. Okay, so what do you say to those people? Exactly. What's the gap for these people? What should they know that they're not knowing, which gives a proper commentary on this capitalist? They have to open up, which a few have done, to learning everything that they were deprived of learning for the last 50 years. They have to learn that there are other ways of organizing an economy. They have to actually take that seriously. They have to denaturalize the notion that there's a tiny group of people at the top of every company that ought to make the, the board of directors or whoever they are. They've got to realize that's only one option of how to do these things. There are others. They're actually out there. You can look at them. They function differently, but not at all less efficiently. They love that word. But you know what's really causing that is not so much the breakdown of this system. It's the terrible problem of China. That's what eats them. Explain that. China is more successful than they are. China is growing much faster. The real wages in China have gone up four times in the last 25 years. American wages are stagnant and flat. I go and debate sometimes, and my counterpart, when I, particularly when I stick it to them about how, the, how well the Chinese are doing, and you know, I'm very critical of the Chinese system, it's not that. Here's the answer. First, they attempt to refute the numbers. The numbers are easy, and they're not good for them. So I go with the numbers when we're done with that. Then they retreat, and the retreat position is, well, they are doing well because they allowed private enterprise. In other words, the story now becomes, okay, if they're any good, it's because they're like us. <laughs> and I, I make fun of them when they do that. I say to them, I've done it on television repeatedly now, you look what you're doing. First you try to fake that there isn't something going on you have to worry about. Then you admit it. And then you tell me the only reason there's good stuff over there is because they're like us. It's like a child. <laughs> and I say to you, know, this is childish stuff. What about the socialist alternative? And I, that's a trap. I do that on purpose. Why? Because they because they have a. They have no.
fucking idea. You know what comes out of their mouth? Well, uh, socialism is when the government. I said, it has nothing to do with the government. I said, I'm a Marxist. Marx did, never wrote a book about the government, didn't give a shit about the government. This is about reorganizing production. Then I give them a lecture. But this is the gap in the knowledge, isn't it? They don't it? know anything. Right, so it's a Pavlovian reaction to the SNM word. Socialism and Marxism. Yes. Socialism for them, take the worst image you have of, I don't know, Stalin or something, this is in their head. For most Americans, when you ask them about socialism, you can see it, and some of them have told it to me, which is where this comes from that I'm about to tell you. Imagine your worst trip to the post office. All you wanted was to buy some stamps and to have your package. <laughs> but that nasty person in the uniform and you're treated curing, you. And you're carrying yeah, around you're, the block. That's right, you're waiting for an hour With for a, some to act his or her grief out on you. So and and you have to fill out 19 forms. That's right. And you've got a piece of crusty bread in your pocket yeah, and no right. one's got any teeth. That's right. And remember in the United States, the way socialism, because that's what they think socialism is, the propaganda program here has been the government is bad. In other words, for them, if this sounds childish to you, it means you're understanding. So don't back away because it's childish. It's the way it works. In this country, United States, for the last 60 years that I've been awake, the way they handled the socialist threat was by saying socialism is when the government does everything, step one. Step two, whenever the government does anything, it's inefficient and wasteful and crude and ugly and smells bad. Okay, therefore socialism is crude, ugly, and smells bad, and they don't want anything to do with it. The beauty of this simplistic ideology is every time capitalism sticks it to the people, they get angry at the politicians. If you lay off a thousand workers in your town in America, the people will get angry at the congressperson or the senator. Who won't they get angry at? The employer who fired them. When they get thrown out of their house because they're not make, making their mortgage it's not payment. not the bank. It's not the lender, it's not the bank. You've treated people, you've given them an entire ideological structure. Badness is government. Badness is socialism. Socialism is government. Hate them all and you're safe. So I have to, figure out, as a socialist, a strategy that deals with that reality. And one of the ploys is to make it clear to them that socialism isn't about the government. Why? First, I believe that, so it's the kind of, that's what I get from Marx. But I also, I'm not naive, I also know that they're not prepared for that. They have no developed ideological coping. When I talk about transforming the enterprise so that the workers democratically control it, I call it the democratization of the enterprise. In this country, democracy is considered good. So I've made a good thing out of the socialism and they don't have the apparatus to refute it. They're stuck and then I run. <laughs> Brilliant. If, if, this, if this sounds to you like thought out strategy, then that's the evidence you need that this is serious in this country. In the context of the American dream, which you I believe has become a nightmare, um, <laughs> as a Marxist economist who read Marx at university when other people weren't, let's say that way, you must never in your lifetime have thought that you would be able to now go and sit on Wall Street and agree from a Marxist point of view and have the Wall Street guys agree on one thing, which is this isn't just a blip, this is a structural issue within this economy. Yes, I am surprised as I am by the degree of disaffection with capitalism that is now okay to speak. I see it in all the places everybody sees it, from Bernie Sanders to Occupy Wall Street to uh, Octavio Ocasio-Cortez, uh, and it's mumbling up from below uh, in many places. Just to use myself as an example, I've done more public speaking in the last five years than in the previous 40, because the demand for what I have to say is suddenly enormous, and self-confident enough to want to arrange a meeting in a union hall, a meeting in a church, a meeting in a university, to discuss all these things. And the questions are not combative. They're questions of clarification. I have a wonderful time because I'm a teacher, because everybody wants to learn about what's wrong with this system. Why is this the first generation of students to be burdened by levels of debt that are literally unmanageable, impeding their choice of partners, their question of whether they have children or not, and all the 
big questions of life. People are discovering that that American dream is out of reach. There's no hope you're going to get it. There's no sign that the downturn, which really hit home in 2008, is ever going away. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's an ironical way it's worse in the United States. Why is that? The government keeps saying, for the obvious self-promoting reasons. Or self-preserving re reasons. Right. Recovery. The word recovery appears 10 times a day in the mass media. This is a kind of torture, because you're telling the people there's a recovery, but they're not experiencing it. So the next step, because we've been trained, is to blame yourself. You must be doing something wrong that you aren't participating in what everybody says is the big recovery, because your job is no good. You had to substitute for your old job, which had an income and security and benefits, a new one where you're a greeter at Walmart, don't know one week from the next what hours you're going to work, what kind of work you're going to do. The modern economy with its euphemistic gig or shared economy is no substitute for the reality, as Americans like to say, that there's too much month at the end of the money. When people stop blaming themselves, where do they start pointing the finger? Well, we have a very traditional split. One effort led by our president is to blame foreigners. We started off uh, with the trade war with the Canadians and Mexicans, nearby foreigners that everybody knows about. Right. When that didn't go too well and ended up in a treaty that's really not much different from the old one, we had a new and more scary foreigner, the Chinese. Right. Now that the stretch out theater of meetings and then will end up with again, not much change, hyped as a great victory. He's already announcing that Europe is going to be his target. He announced tarifts on wine and cheese. I mean, the mentality here, this is promotion. So it's scapegoating, but it's scapegoating and That's I think right. because there's one finger pointing out, there's three pointing back, but we can't look at these three because it's not us. You know why? Because we're the best in the world. That's right. And, but get really angry, folks, one group of people, at poor immigrant families from Honduras that want to come across the border in Texas. Right. And they are threatening us. It, notice the language, an invasion, a hype language that is completely out of control. A caravan. A caravan, and we have to have the army to go down. Just theater. The other way, though, is to become critical of the structure. And now you have in the United States, because it survived across the 50 years after World War II, you have the revival of an interest in alternatives to capitalism, which are not going to be brushed away with the usual dismissive references to, I don't know, Stalin or something. This won't work anymore. People are not interested. That's ancient history. Very upsetting to the older generation, for whom these kinds of dismissals, oh, Stalin, or oh, this, that used to work very well in the United States. It's now old potatoes and nobody's interested. I'm an economic historian and I specialize in how economies change over time. So I noticed something. Every economic system the human race has ever displayed has the following characteristic. It's born, it evolves over time, <laughs> and it dies. The burden is on the lovers of capitalism to give me a reason to believe it won't go through those stages the way every other one. Feudalism did, slavery did, primitive tribal societies did, you know, tributary, all the ways we do that. So capitalism obviously was born and capitalism has evolved, which means the next stage is it dies. Mm. And then the only interesting question becomes when and how and soon are we already in that process? I'm beginning to wonder this could maybe be the death throw. Watching the British destroy themselves around Brexit, watching this country not only elect a Trump, but continue enough support that he can continue being in the naughty boy position and behaving outrageously. I think these are signs of social disaffection. Clearly the splitting of our country intellectually and ideologically, the polarization, particularly on the right, that has gone very quickly, much faster than on the left, and much further than on the left. The imagery, even the, the colorful imagery of the end of times, the use of biblical references to catastrophe, the number of films about a tsunami or a hurricane, that be, the, the imagery is already there for the country. The language of the president who has to justify even the littlest policy adjustment in global, you know, the caravan, you know, 12 desperate families become a caravan, you know, these are signs, yes. You're unique insofar as you've been so diverse in your reading and learning about economic history. So from your standpoint, 
What's, what's the next bit? It's a little awkward, and I don't mean to disrespect people with whom I disagree, but who have taught me. But the, for me, the interesting thing about Marx is not so much what Marxists made of it, but it's what I get from reading that literature, which is quite different from what other people get, but that should surprise no one. Uh, but in my reading, the key problem is how we organize the production and distribution of goods and services, the economy. How's that done? We do it in a peculiar way in capitalism. We have a tiny minority of people, the owners of the enterprise, the board of directors, the major shareholders, whatever you call them, and they have all the power. They decide what the enterprise produces, they decide what technology is used, they decide physically and geographically where the production is, and then most important, they alone decide what to do with the profits that everybody has helped to produce. This is not democratic, this is not egalitarian, this is an autocracy, a dictatorship of a tiny group of people inside every factory, every office, every store in capitalism. For me, that's the problem Marx identifies. That's the problem that has to be addressed. Since you spend most of your adult life working, five out of the seven days, the best hours of the day, you're in the workplace. If you're committed to democracy, that would have been the first place you instituted. We've never done that. The United States as a country goes around the world claiming it's bringing a democracy. You can't bring it because you don't have it. You don't have it to bring. And I would argue that many of the key problems like inequality could be better handled by a transformation of the enterprise than by anything else that has been tried to this point. Will future economic historians look back and uh, say that the Jeff Bezos moment was the moment where we really crystallized all that was wrong with this system? I don't know if I'd go quite that far, but your basic point I think is valid, that the inequality is the raw end of the nerve of what's going on. It is what everybody sees every day. You know, we just went through, speaking of Jeff Bezos, a kind of national humiliation in which he, Mr. Bezos, and his company, Amazon, invited the cities and towns and counties of the United States to compete with one another for the decision of where he is going to build his second headquarters. Town after town. Fell over themselves. That's right. Used up very scarce resources of planners and city officials to put together glowing, begging, on their knees, begging, would this rich man give them some jobs? And they were prepared, I don't know if you know the details, to give enormous subsidies. New York State and City offered $3 billion. We are going to give a man whose personal wealth is $150 billion an extra three, which he doesn't need, to make his company, already very profitable, even more profitable. The people in New York rose against it. Another sign of change. So he couldn't come here. But Look at the spectacle, and nobody is lost on that. The country divides into those disgusted by what it means and those who defend it by the argument, we need those rich people. That's not a sustainable argument. They will lose that in the long run. But that argument is based on another facile belief, which is trickle-down economics. Absolutely. Right. What is the percentage between the people who reject that argument and say, no, we don't want this anymore, and the people who absolutely defend it and defend it to the death? Well, here's the interesting answer has to be split. I'm happy to tell you that I would guess at least 80% of the people are disgusted and agree that it's outrageous. So it's 80-20? Yes, 80-20. But out of that 80, at least another 30 don't think it's safe to say so. So if you ask them, they will say, well, of course we have to. They don't like it. Give them two drinks and out it'll come. But they feel they have to, that this is the way the country has been running, which is true. This is the way everything seems to work, which has certain also been true. So it, we dare not, but we don't like it. When does it get so bad? Because the point is, you don't want it to get that bad, do you? You want to head this off, because no one wants human suffering. No. There's a lot of it. Not only that, but as I said before, I don't know how that, if it explodes, exactly how that shakes out, where that'll end up. I'm not so confident, so I'm frightened a little bit about that. When people say, gee, could there be fascism coming here? Well, sometimes I listen to Mr. Trump. Sure it could. You'd be naive to think it didn't. But I think what's happening here, and here's my hope, I guess, is that the cultural forms, 
the young people who are being alienated, the way music is going, the way film is going, the way young writers are going, that there's more and more of a recognition we need fundamental change. And most of that is coming over to our side. It's not going to be impressed by a fat old man who wants to make America great again. That's the past. That's old. My guess is we'll probably be stimulated, if that's the right word, by some event. You have put a generation of students in an impossible situation. Students are young, students are not yet settled in life. You have fooled them for a while. You've told them that the gig economy or the shared economy or the hustle economy is an exciting new place. So most of them can't manage in that way. They've learned that. They're now telling the younger people, 10 or five or 10 years younger than them, that they go out on dates with, that this is a dead end, that this is a hype that is not really available to them. Meanwhile, they can't live in an apartment by themselves. They have to double up with roommates. They have to do all kinds of things. You know, in a society that had been deprived of these things a long time, this might all be absorbed as the way the world is. But American capitalism, from the end of World War II to the present, built its own defense on the notion, we produce a big middle class, and we raise your wages, and we pro Now this is all being taken away. That's a very different experience if you had it, and if you were led to expect it, because your parents promised you the American dream, and you're getting the American not so dreamy, uh, the reaction becomes easier for you to break from something and to see the break as not your fault of not conforming, but the failure of a promise, which is what it is. I knew that something fundamental had shifted when my whole adult life of teaching about how monetary and fiscal policy can manage capitalism was exploded by the crash of 2008 into smithereens. I don't think the profession has really recovered. The old neoclassicals are holding on, but they're holding on to a sinking ship. And if you look at most graduate programs in economics, the majority of students today are not Americans. They're foreign students who are here to get a credential that they can use when they go home. But here in this country, it's, it's a profession with very few interested people. It is compromised beyond in my judgment, Jan, much rescue. Multipolar world here to stay? Yeah, and having its ramifications inside the country as it becomes multiply diverse in ways that frighten some and excite others. But the excitement part is growing a lot faster to the chagrin of those that don't want it. Richard Wolf, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.